Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Reason We Learn. I'm Deb Philman, mom, homeschooler, ex-teacher, and individualist. Today, I'm going to read a little story to you. And I chose this story because I think there's a good lesson. Um, let's see if you can figure out what the lesson might be. This, as you can see, is a very, very old book. It is called, you won't be able to see it from here, but it's by Ludwig Bemelmans. And it's called The Castle Number Nine. You can barely make out the castle here. For those of you who are uh, children's lit aficionados, you might recognize some of these illustrations as being very, very familiar because they are in the same style as other books that Mr. Bemelmans did by the name of Madeline. Okay, so here we go. That is my dad's handwriting from when he was a small child. <laughs> okay. Give them honor, give them fame. A health to hands that fight the flame. All right, there's some meaning there too. The Castle Number Nine. Story and Pictures by Ludwig Bemelmans. The Viking Press, New York, 1937. First chapter. The White House, the second from the left, stood in the little Austrian town of Melk on the Danube. On the top floor of this building lived the good Baptiste, peaceful and alone, with his black cat that can be seen on the roof, with his three-branch silver candlestick, and his honest, God-fearing soul. In the closet of his living room hung six fine liveries, one for each day of the week. Each uniform was a different color, an especially proud one, purple with heavy gold braid and tassels, much embroidery and ornamental buttons, was for Sundays, birthdays, wedding anniversaries, and holidays. Baptiste had worn these garments in the castles of dukes, kings, and princes. Under the uniforms, in a neat row on a shelf, stood seven pairs of glossy pumps with gold buckles. And over them, behind the green curtain, to keep them free from dust, were his seven wing wigs, carefully combed and neatly tied with black ribbons. The three-branched silver, can silver candlesticks stood on his table. It had been given him by his late last master, with the sum of money and trust with which to be free from worry, and with which to buy the best polish to keep the candlesticks shining brightly, to supply it with the final candles of scented beeswax, and to light it every night. Baptiste carried out these last wishes faithfully and to the letter as he had promised. He lived frugally. He had only one knife, one fork, and one glass. He darned his own stockings, did his own shopping, and everybody in Melk knew what day it was when he walked about. Look, it's Saturday, said the children. Baptiste is in his yellow livery. What's interesting is this was black and white, and my father colored it in yellow crayon. <laughs> In the evenings, he opened his large album bound in velvet with metal corners and read with contentment through the many pages on which were written the most glowing recommendations, with advice and words of friendship from his former masters. In this book was the story of his useful life. On Sundays, when he had eaten, washed his dishes, and finished reading, then Baptiste dressed carefully in his purple livery, lighted the silver candlestick, and with that in his right hand and his cat on his shoulder, looked into the mirror and was homesick for a castle. Because he had only one knife, one fork, and one glass, he could never invite anybody to be his guest, and he sat much alone with his cat. On rainy evenings, when the sun for a brief moment shone from under the low clouds before it set beyond the hills, when the bells rang in the abbey above and it was time to trim the wicks and light the candles, he said to himself and his cat while he looked for the matches, Here we are alone. I am only sixty-five years old. I have been a good servant all of my life, and still I am not happy. Why? On one such evening, after he thought like this again, all the way to the end where he found the matches and sighed and said to the cat, why, his eyes fell on the back page of the Little Milk newspaper. Between an advertisement for a, sp a spinet and the happy announcement of a baby's birth was a notice in which the Count Hungerberg Hungerberg made known his need of a good, honest, and able manservant. The address was Castle No. 9, Post Office, Hall in Tyrol. Baptiste followed each word with his finger. He read the notice twice and then once more, and then he spoke so loud that the cat sat up to listen. Honest, able, good manservant. That is Baptiste. 
This is a call for no one but me. Quickly, he took a quill and paper from the drawer under the table and wrote to the Count Hungerberg Hungerberg. He sealed the letter, put it in the album, wrapped up his album with the glowing recommendations, and ran down to the post office to mail it. Two weeks later, the postman rang and handed Baptiste a large envelope with a crest and a heavy seal on it. Inside was a picture and a plan of the castle, and a note written in a bold, proud, and generous hand. Come, it said. Come, my good Baptiste. Come immediately, and bring your cat and the fine candlestick. Bring your seven pairs of pumps and the liveries and the wigs. Bring yourself and your good services. Hungerberg, Hungerberg. Baptiste packed his trunk carefully, took the cat and candlestick, and walked to the place where the post chaise start, started off for Innsbruck and Holland to roll. Again, he colored with blue crayon. Second chapter. Where is castle number nine, said Baptiste to four people when he arrived in Hall. Go over the bridge, past the church, out the city gate, and there on the second hill to the right you will find the castle number nine, they said. And there was the castle. Count Hungerberg Hungerberg and his brown poodle were on the bridge, the Count feeding his swans and little ducks in the moat. He smiled and said, I am Hungerberg Hungerberg, and you are Baptiste, and today is Friday. When I'm in blue, it's Monday, sir, answered Baptiste with a polite bow. How time flies, said the Count. Please go into the house and wait for me. The Count's brown poodle sniffed around Baptiste three times, and Baptiste bent down and asked him to shake hands. But the cat saw the dog and jumped from Baptiste's shoulder. The poodle chased the cat, and Baptiste ran after them, down the stairs, into the cellar, up again through the kitchen and the dining hall, up the stairs into the bedroom and the library, and from there all the way to the top of the tower, into Baptiste's room, over his bed, up to the ceiling of heavy oaken beams. And here is the interior of the castle with the little cat, and the bed, and the heater, Oh, actually, it's a wood stove and the books and the dining room and the kitchen and the winding stairs to the tower. It's actually quite accurate for how such structures are built, especially in Austria. Baptiste had followed on the heels of the animals all the way up. He locked the cat into the room and left the poodle outside sniffing at the door, walked downstairs and just had time to straighten his wig in the mirror of the entrance hall when the Count came in. Now I will show you the castle, said the Count. I have seen it, sir, said Baptiste. Impossible, whispered the Count to himself. I have seen it from the cellar to the roof. What is at the right side of the cellar stairs as you go down? Hmm, said Count Hungerberg Hungerberg with raised eyebrows. In the cellar, at the right side of the stairs as you go down, sir, is a stack of firewood. Beside, besides, along the wall are two saddles and at the end two wine barrels, one for white, the other for red wine. The tap on the red wine barrel is loose and dripping. I shall put a pan under it. On the table in the kitchen are dumplings for dinner. The cruet in the dining hall is short, the dining room is short of vinegar. There's a tie back missing on a curtain in your library. The stove in your bedroom smokes. I love my room. From its window, I can see all the way to hall. The bed is comfortable, and here's my trunk, ended Baptiste, pointing to the door. The Count sat down with silent surprise, and Baptiste disappeared up the stairs with the two men and his trunk. He unpacked it, and when he was finished, he whistled softly to himself. So did the Count below, and both were happy that they had found each other. Third chapter. On the first Sunday, Baptiste in his purple uniform found the Count in deep thought, looking out first on one side of the castle, his castle and then on the other side. That evening, the Count had no appetite. He refused to eat, even roast goose and vegetables from his own garden. Take it away, Baptiste, he said. Eat it yourself, and I hope you will enjoy it, for I can't. Why are you so worried, sir, said Baptiste, and ever after was sorry to have asked the question. It's a long story, said the Count. Sit down, my good Baptiste, and I will tell you. But Baptiste stood, and the Count said, I am worried about how wrongly all things are named in this world. For example, look at him, and he pointed to his dog. The poodle came up to the table and licked his hand and wagged the remnant of a tail they had left him when he was young and trimmed. What does dog mean? It means nothing. And besides, it's an insult. What is he, the Count asked, pointing to the poodle. An animal, sir. A watchful animal, said Baptiste. No, 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 said the Count. There are animals without number, and many of them are watchful. Try again, my good Baptiste. Ah, uh, ah, uh, oh, um, perhaps a noble, mobile Baptiste? I will tell you, said the Count. He is man's best friend. He licks my hand and rubs his head on my knee, and at the same time he wags his tail in friendship. He is my friend on both ends, and from now on we will call him friend on both ends. Friend on both ends, repeated Baptiste. 
But after a while, he said, isn't it a little too long, friend on both ends? Poodle and dog are such short words. What of it, the Count said. Besides, we can save on other words. From tomorrow morning on, instead of saying good night and good morning, we will silently bow to each other and smile. Next are you, continued the Count, looking out of the window. When I think of you, I do not think of Baptiste. I think of bring me something. Your name, my friend, from this hour on will be bring me. Friend on both ends and bring me, repeated Baptiste. Bed is another useless word, continued the Count. It's a box, and I dream in it. My bed will be dream box. And the stairs, they lift my legs. The stairs will be the leg lifter. Friend on both ends, dream box, bring me, mumbled Baptiste, and went to, out to get a glass of water. That is not all, said the Count, when Baptiste came back. Look at the fire in the chimney. Baptiste, I mean, bring me. The flames dance happily. Fire will be happy. And the cat, he pulls his claws up. The cat is henceforth claw high. Now let's see if you can remember all this. Friend on both ends, bring me, leg lifter, dream box, happy, claw high. Very good, said the Count. Very good. I have thought of one more, your candlestick. The candles drip and their lights are chips of the sun. Therefore, sun drops is the correct word. Sun drops, said Baptiste after him. And the Count said, that is all for today. Good night. Bring me bowed to the Count. Tomorrow we will name household objects, furniture, umbrellas, etc., etc., and next week, on the first day without rain, we will go out and find the proper names of all the animals in the forest and the fields, bats, brooks, clouds, trees, and flowers. Outside, Baptiste sat down on the lowest step of the leg lifter and held his head. Claw High leaned on him. Then Baptiste walked up to his room. His lips moved silently, and he repeated the new words over and over to himself. He even wrote them on the wall over his bed, and then he undressed and lay down. Then he blew out the candles and went to sleep. Fourth chapter. In the middle of a cold night, Bring Me ran out of the castle, and behind him, friend on both ends, and behind him, Claw High. They ran down the hill through the city gate to the house of the fire chief, who was also the town baker. They rang his bell long and loudly, and when he finally opened the shutters, Bring Me said to him, Friend on both ends chased Claw High down the leg lifter, then knocked over the sun drops which fell in the dream box, and now the whole castle is happy. He pointed at the dog's tail, which was smoking, and with the other hand at the castle, which was, indeed, happy. "'What nonsense is this to wake me up with in the middle of the night?' shouted the chief. And Baptiste, wringing his hands, had to explain all about the new words. When he understood them all, the chief said, "'Ha, ha, 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 ho, ho, ha, 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 ha,' and he repeated after Baptiste, "'Claw high, bring me, leg lifter, sun drops, friend on both ends.' "'Fine,' said Baptiste. "'Very fine, chief. You have forgotten only dream box, but that does not matter now. Please, please hurry.' Dream box, leg lifter, friend on both ends, sun drops, happy, claw high, bring me. Once more, the chief repeated the words to himself as he jumped into his uniform. Now I've got them all, he said, and shouted down the window. Dream box, leg lifter, friend on both ends, sun drops, happy, claw high, bring me. At last, the chief blew his trumpet out into the night to call the firemen. When they were all present, he told them about the new language, and they all had to laugh so much it took them so long to learn the words that when they finally started up the hill... It was too late. The fireman left and went home to bed. It was cold and wet, dark and windy. Baptiste and Count Hungerberg Hungerberg moved closer to the fire to warm their hands, and the Count said, My good friends, we have learned that in this life one should always call all things by their right and proper names. From now on you are dog and cat again. Bring me is Baptiste and Dreambox is a bed. And the castle number nine is herewith ended. And so, my friends, I suggest that we all think about what we are doing to our language and how we are no longer calling things by their proper names, how we are reinventing words on the fly, creating new speak every day, something new, something different, something that no longer means what it actually means and means something entirely different and it will probably change again tomorrow and when it does we will no longer know what anything is until we are told what it is by the people who change the words thank you for listening i hope you get the point have a great evening <laughs>